people use the buzzword generational wealth all the time, but don't realize that it takes a generation to build it. It may take you seven or eight years to get the first 100,000, and that's fine, because the next one will be even shorter. Food is a universal language. When we eat together, and drink together, we learn together. And there are few topics more important to learn and more taboo than, than money. money. So join us as we travel around the country, supporting small businesses, enjoying delicious food, having amazing drinks, and, and putting, putting money, money on the table. I'm so glad you made it, man. Yeah, yeah it journey. was it was a journey. It was I think the right term is it's a quest. Yeah. Exactly what it was. Yeah. Uh, but we made it. Yeah, made yeah. It. So you're from Tulsa, yeah. born and raised. So like you, like you're Tulsa proud. Yeah. You know what I mean. So like can from like can you rep Tulsa? You yeah, know what I mean. Yeah. So like can you talk to me a little bit about like what that pride is and like what it means to you and you know is it is it is it just you <laughs> or is it a Tulsa thing like? I, I think I, I may wear a little bit more on my sleeves than, than yeah. most, yeah. Um, but but we are proud of, of being here. Yeah. Um, my my roots in Tulsa do go pretty deep. So okay. for example, on Green Greenwood Avenue, uh, my middle school is Carver Middle School. My mm -hmm. daughter is named Carver after George Washington Carver. Um, went to Booker T. Washington High School, which is the the primary high school, especially during that time, the mm -hmm. 1920s. Booker T. Washington went to Hampton Institute at that point in time, and he's the one who named the Greenwood area uh, Negro Wall Street. Okay. So I, now I didn't know at the time I went to Hampton, but the things just tended to, to intersect. So yeah. um, my family's been here for generations, and it's just um, just interesting to see how like more attention has come up over the last few years. Yeah, yeah. It's not as if like this is something that you were um, that you always knew, right? Like you sort of learned over the years. Like how did you? come to learn about what happened here a hundred years ago yeah so for me growing up you you get like bits and pieces mm -hmm. so you've got older people like you go to church and you hear people who were in their 70s 80s who may have went through it so you would hear yeah. like little whispers about hey this happened and this happened and you're like yeah you know google wasn't around for me to like really verify that stuff yeah. at that point in time um but my dad did teach us a little bit about black wall street growing up and that was like my first like there was something that was here now, because we were six, seven, eight years old, we didn't really get to the massacre part of things, but we did know that there was there was a thriving black community. Um, I had one lesson in like sixth or seventh grade about the massacre part of it, mm -hmm. and then really didn't hear anything else until college. Wow. And the curriculum that was supposed to be instituted didn't really start until 2019, 2020. Okay. So that tells you like the gap in time and the amount of information that is unknown. 83% of people in Oklahoma don't know or didn't know that the massacre even happened up until this year. Wow. No, that's shocking to me that 83% of Oklahoma residents like just had never heard of it. Like it feels like it's a huge part of the history, but I'm guessing that's because of my lens as a black American, like thinking about I mean, it's, it's, reasons to come to Oklahoma. It's a huge part of history if it's in the history book, which right. wasn't exactly the case. You might get a paragraph here or there, but the way, the way that this, came about in terms of like the historical part and the documentation part, we really didn't start documenting until after the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. The first report that the state did about the massacre was in 2001. So it was really from 2001 to 2021 that we're gathering all this information, this data, we're just now digging for the more than 300 mass graves and we found a few of those, but that's now, yeah. right? So that's a, a big part of it is that most people just didn't really know unless you were here and experienced it and happened to pass that down word of mouth to, to family members. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally understand that spirit. Because you and I, I think we had a brief exchange, but like, mm -hmm. let's just call it what it is. Um, you, you had some, some choice words and feelings about, what's it called? 
Greenwood Bank. Greenwood, yeah. Greenwood yeah. Bank. Greenwood Bank and the Tulsa yeah. Real Estate Fund. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. both both of those were the most egregious. Yeah. Um, now, to be fair, for Greenwood Bank, they did come here for their centennial. They did give a check to one of the black-owned barbershops on Greenwood. So yeah. I do appreciate them for that. Yeah. Um, but like the Tulsa Real Estate Fund. Well, hold on. Before we even move forward, like, is that is that enough though? No, in your opinion. Yeah. no, no. Not, not if you name think... your your product right, 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 after right. something, then like there should be a connection to it. I there think should that's be... a fair critique. Right? A yeah, absolutely. And I, I think at the time, my critique was you have done nothing, so now yeah. I've done something. So <laughs> I have to be you know, correct the record to a degree. For us to have gone through this for so long and nobody was really paying attention until maybe even five years ago. Yeah. yeah. And people are still here, like still suffering, still trying to figure out absolutely. what's going on. And it's like, don't, don't come here, make your money, raise X millions of dollars, and then leave and say, like, hey, we just built all this stuff in Atlanta or elsewhere. Yeah. It just, just piles onto the erasure. Like, yeah. the fact that it happened and that, to your point, there are probably our families who have been here for generations, lived through it, still reeling from loss, both financially and emotionally and physically. And then to see, like, you know, million dollar startups pop up in other cities named after after your home like that's got to be right like you're literally you're capitalizing on, on exactly our pain. exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah that's tough yeah i was telling julian that one of the reasons i was excited to come here is because things like black wall street and places like tulsa i've spent my entire life sort of intellectualizing them understanding them in theory reading about it i can tell you about it i can give you date you know dates names all sorts of you know, milestones in, in the area, but like I haven't been, I haven't talked to anybody. I haven't actually spent my dollars in this community. And it was really important for me to do that because now I understand what that means. Like what Tulsa needed before and after the centennial celebration and all of the black people coming in and like telling their story is customers, is dollars flowing into their economy, is visitors, is tourists. And so I'm glad we could do our part. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're here at Fulton Street Books and coffee. You are an author and the recent author of this book. What was, well, one, what's the book and what is, or what was the inspiration behind writing it? Yeah, so the, the book from Burning the Blueprints, um, How to Rebuild Black Wall Street After a Century of Silence. And for me, the motivation was to get out in front because I knew it was gonna be a lot of media attention in 2021 Smart. and say, this is what's going on. This is what happened in Tulsa, but I more importantly wanted to weave through the legacy and survival of white supremacy and say it didn't just happen one flash in the pan this was just the end of it 100 years ago bam and that was it yeah. so that was number one so i weave through stories about wilmington in um, 1898 i talk about tulsa i talk about the red summer of 1919 and really set the context of what was going on in the country that led up to this and how is it still continue today but the second half of the book talks about black generational wealth yeah. because it's 99% of the books that you read about Tulsa is gonna say, here's the history, this is what happened, here's Tulsa today, end of story. Right. And I wanted to say, well, what now? Like, where yeah. do we go from here? How do we rebuild that? And what are the tools that we need in today? Because a lot of people say like, let's go back and build shops, let's buy the block, which is cool, yeah. right? But like- That's one way. Yeah, that, that's one way, but yeah. like, we own Bitcoin and yeah. all types of stuff yeah. nowadays. So yeah. we have to have to adjust for that. And I think, you know, from the, even the, the book design, a lot of a lot of books are going to have fire bombings just like a real negative depiction and it was a negative event yeah. but i'm looking forward yeah. so i wanted to say like here's what happened but here's how we move forward and here's how we kind of rebuild and reclaim our wealth is there any one particular message of all in the book that you want people to walk away with i would say that communities like the Greenwood District happened on purpose. So it was mm -hmm. two men who bought tracts of land and almost exclusively sold them to black people. Yep. And black people took pride in not only owning their own businesses, but working here and spending money in the community. I think a lot of times when we think about history, it's just like, oh, it just happened. I don't know what happened. Like that was just exceptional, intentional. right? Yeah. Right, it was intentional. They did it on purpose. And for us to recreate that, we have to exercise some some discipline, some, some intentionality is not gonna just happen again yeah. out of nowhere. Okay.
radio show in Manhattan, you said something to me. It was the first time I'd ever heard the phrase, and you, you called us um, that we were the flies in the buttermilk. Of the fire movement. Of the fire movement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I knew exactly what you meant uh, when you said it, and it stuck with me so much, so I'm pretty sure like we wrote that into uh, to our book. I'm pretty sure it's like the opening line. We tried to name a chapter after it. Flies in the buttermilk, <laughs> flies yeah. Flies in the buttermilk. <laughs> but, um, as I'm thinking about it, like you in a way are a fly in buttermilk yourself as a financial advisor, as a black financial advisor. I don't remember the exact statistic, but I'm pretty sure it's like three to 4% of all financial advisors are black. And so one, I wanted to get your thoughts on like what that feels like and whether or not you feel like uniquely qualified in some ways to serve like the black community because of your familiarity with the culture. Yeah, so I, I think it does make you uniquely qualified and useful yeah. to the community, which is what I really like about it is because when everybody has these questions all the time, like I got a pension in my job, I don't know, what should I do with this? What is this, right? So to have sometimes family or friends or even go to church and like teach people like this is what you should be doing yeah. is really empowering to say like, I can do something to impact my community. In terms of what it's like on the corporate end or even just out there in the world is isolating because you don't, the roadmap isn't always there for you on here's how you, for what you're trying to do, here's your career path, here's your mentor, here's how, how everything is supposed to look like. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think I saw my first black financial advisor in person until I was already in the job, like six or eight months. And um, it just, looking back on it, like my early career, it's like, man, I, I could have done so much better had I met this person first, or had I known these rules that were for me that didn't exist. Yeah. I think in the absence of black financial advisors, or at least relatable financial advisors, whether that's culturally or racially, people turn to social media, books, podcasts, movies. There's so much media out there now for personal finance. And I think a lot of it is built for the internet. So it's very simple, hard and fast rules of thumbs, headlines, not a lot of nuance. And I'm wondering in a year where so many people were interested in finance for the first time because investing was fun and public, mm -hmm. do you think most new investors are oversimplifying investing or are they overcomplicating it because there's so much advice out there? Yeah, I, I'm gonna give the, the typical financial answers, it depends. <laughs> but <laughs> it's the, still my life. Right. <laughs> so the, the weird thing is, I think the most complicated investments are oversimplified mm. and the easy ones are overcomplicated. Yeah. So like when you talk about cryptocurrencies or NFTs, like mm. people are like, oh yeah, you just get in and just do this thing and you good. Like we saw what happened with Dogecoin earlier this year. Yeah, I was still a lot of the research that people should have did before you did that. Right. But it was super simple, right? Elon Musk tweeted it, so I got to do it. Right. Real simple, low barrier to entry, people lost money. Right. <laughs> so when it comes to individual stocks or even index funds, people make that this most complicated, you got to read charts, you got to do this, you got to do that. I'm you like, be a CFO. Yeah, right. I'm like, like you don't have to. <laughs> right. Like, you can, but it's not going to make you that much better, you right. know? So I think it's, it's weird because on the opposite ends of that. I feel like we have a controversial take when it comes to financial education, um, because it's not that we are anti or against financial education, but I do think one of the things that we've noticed, just having only been in the space a couple of years, is that it seems like all of the woes that our community goes through are sort of lumped together under the umbrella of financial illiteracy. And because of that, there seems to be like a bit of a over-focus on financial education. And what I mean by that is, like if you, if you define the problem as financial illiteracy, well then naturally education is going to be the solution for that. Like, do you agree with that? Or do you also feel that maybe there are other factors or the emotional, social, or cultural factors that sort of play a role into why more people aren't, let's say, making sound financial decisions? Yeah, I, it's technically it's both. Yeah. Because let's say we had the exact same financial education as every other minority group or, or racial group in the U.S., the the wealth gap would still exist. 100%. And, that, and that's the thing. And I think that part is oversimplified where like, you read this book and you do this and y'all just do better yeah. and boom, you're done. When in reality, 
if we still not paid the same. Period. So, <laughs> so I can say the exact same amount, the exact same thing you told me to, and it's still going to be a or gap. Or the same in. percentage. Or, yeah, or the same, or the the same, same percentage. percentage. But yeah. when you're talking about 63 cents to a dollar, 67, percent to a, 67 exactly. cents to a dollar, it's like, right. I'm still not going to come out the same way you did. Right, or but. even take, take college education. Like, we pay, we take on more student loan debt, we pay more in student loan interest, and we get less in return once you get paid. Yeah. So we're getting, quote unquote, the same degree, right? Yeah. Like, it's supposed to be this great equalizer, except we're the ones taking on more more weight for that. And it actually widens the racial wealth gap. Exactly, because actually, of that. right. Even though we could be sitting in the exact same class <laughs> and getting that, that you know, the, the great equalizer, right? But when we walk out, out the door, you had either my zero. My don't look like woofers, or you may not have a bill. Right, right. right. <laughs> so you you walk in the door, you can get the house, do all this kind of stuff. I'm sitting there like, man, how many how many years am I going to pay this back right. before I can do X, Y, and Z? Yeah. I've read my fair share of personal finance books, books about wealth building. And by and large, many of them like sort of capture the same sentiments, like the power uh, of index fund investing, especially for the average investor. But I know you're also very pro like individual stock investing. So like, can you talk to me a little bit about what do you think the average investors should be doing, right? Should they be, or could they be both? Should they just be focusing on one over the other? Or like, what are some of the pitfalls of let's say one versus the other? Yeah, so I think the average investor, especially one that does not want to be overly concerned or involved in the day-to-day -day moves of the market, or even like the you know quarterly moves of the market, if you will, it, just stick it in the index fund and mind your business. That's, it works, <laughs> it's boring, but it works, right? And I think that's the, the most important thing. Exactly, um, does it work? Yeah, do, does it work? I think. A lot of times in the investing space, it's a weird, weird dynamic where some people, so I'll put it like this, index funds, in my view, from, from what I've seen, from managing 140 million, from teaching people for 11 years, I think an index fund is going to provide, I think it has 90, 90 95% chance of success, right? But that ain't what everybody's talking about. Everybody wants no. that that five percent chance. Let me get in on this forex, yeah. where that don't work. <laughs> Unregulated market. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. Like, you want to do forex. You want to do all this new stuff that has like a five percent chance, a ten percent chance because it's fun. Versus like take the layup. Take the layup. It's there, right? <laughs> I love this first reference. <laughs> Just she'll tell you because it's that people want to be home run hitters. Yes. And what I've been trying to tell them is bunt. Yeah. Get up there, punt. The it's right. effective. You're gonna yeah. get on first. You're gonna advance the runners. You're gonna score. You're gonna win games. Just punt. But yeah. nobody wants to go to the Hall of Fame yeah. for being a bunter. Right. They want to make the sports center top ten. Exactly. They want to hit the home run out of the park. You know, and like that's part of the challenge here. It's like how do we make boring sexy? Yeah, well, <laughs> you know I what I mean? I think it, it comes into that that balance, right? Like I, I fought that battle for many years saying index funds only, don't worry about all the other stuff, like just focus on what works. But like you said, everybody wants to, I want to be the highlight. Forget who wins, they don't even show that part, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but I, I got to a point and with, with more data and more research that you can be somewhere in the middle. Exactly. So for, for, for me and per recommendations of other financial professionals, you can have 90% of your money in index funds and have your little 10 to kind of invest in what you want to invest in. And at times, if you got an Apple or a Tesla earlier this year or a few years ago, you can do it a tiny bit better and that's fine. I think because you have it segmented kind of on, on, on its own, you mess up, it's fine. You got the 90%, right? I think people need to realize that you don't have to be so hardcore for either one. Yeah. But if you do index funds, nothing else, you're good. If you want to do a little bit of stocks, that's fine, but don't overcomplicate and definitely don't be overconfident because you got lucky in 2020 that that's this just how this is, yes. right? It ain't yes. like that. So I think that's that's the next challenge is people who just started think that they know everything. And because they did well in 2020. Yeah, you did. Yeah. You did well. Like, that's not a great year to set your baseline. <laughs> it's like, like, any benchmark, <laughs> right? Unless we're talking benchmark. about pandemic period compared to another pandemic, pandemic period. period. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, for the market, I've, I've got videos of me saying like it'll recover in like two years. Like I, yeah. I didn't think it was gonna be two months, <laughs> right? So, you know, I, I think you don't want to take that and say, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing because I did this last year. Yeah. It's 
it, this is a decades long game and it's hard, incredibly hard to be right every single year. Talk to me more about the decades long, because I think I know where you're going with that, but why specifically a decade? Was that just a random number or like, tell me why you just used a decade versus 15 years or 20 years? When I use decades, I like to use it because it sets the expectation that's not going to be something that's going to be done overnight. Correct. I think when we're talking about real wealth, it is very rarely built within six months or a year and sometimes even five years. It takes time for that money to compound and then for you to figure out where you want to be and reallocate and kind of do all that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, people use the buzzword generational wealth all the time but don't realize that it takes a generation to build it for yes. most people. Like, yes. unless you get a huge paycheck, it's gonna take you a while to hit that first million, right? Yeah. It may take you seven or eight years to get the first 100,000, and that's fine, because the next one will be even shorter, exactly. right? Exactly. But it took me seven, seven and a half years to get that first 100. I'm like, okay, all right, now I start to see where this is going. But like, if I just, if I didn't say decades, and I just said like, yeah, six months, I'd be all right. You know, it's, that would have threw me, threw me off. I would have felt like I was behind, I would have quit. Yeah. And then try to hit a home run because I feel behind at this point. That's the hardest part trying to explain because the brain doesn't calculate non-linear math mm -hmm. like the way that we calculate just regular math. Mm -hmm. And so when you try to explain to somebody in the 10 years, the last three are when you're gonna see the most growth, mm -hmm. don't quit before year seven. Like, I know you're gonna want to because it's gonna feel like, damn, I gave myself a 10 year t timeline. I'm at year seven and I'm not seeing it. But like it all comes at the end because of the way compounding works and because you need that, you know, larger balance for compounding to actually make sense. I have this phrase that I use, slow then sudden. Like that's my mantra for our building our business, for our investments, because it is slow. But then all of a sudden, like the, the chart changes and it could be that you had been in the game long enough so that you were taking riskier investments and those things start to start start to pay off. It could be that you finally hit the magic number of 100,000 or a million, whatever the first is for you, and then your accounts start compounding faster. But it is slow at first, and then things change like in a dramatic fashion for yeah. most wealthy people. Absolutely. Speaking of slow then sudden, <laughs> kids. kids, man, <laughs> change your life suddenly. Uh, you're now a father of two. Second baby was a pandemic baby, bless your heart. <laughs> um, but you wrote a article on fatherhood and what you wanted for your son and this idea of never having to wonder what if. Yeah. And I wanted to see if you still felt that way, if you still feel like you there are things that you're wondering what if about now and what that article meant to you. Yeah, I mean, that the article for me was, I would, I want to over blow it up and say like it was life changing, yeah. but it, it did kind of reset my faith and belief in what I'm trying to do for my kids. And for people to share it so loudly and resonate with that really meant a lot. Yeah. It was also cool to have my son like on a cover page for like, I mean, I'm like, he's hey, so like, you know, so that was, that was really <laughs> cool. But all of this really like hit home for me and changed for me in 2010. So it's the same time I went to New York. I was an awful intern. I tell people all the time I was the worst intern you could ever have. Like <laughs> dead sleep. So I was tired and sleeping in the middle of a meeting. But the way explained what investing was. So they're like talking about macroeconomic trends, all these charts. I'm just like, just gone. Snoring, like, oh my God, it's eleven and I just like they saw me sleep. Right. So aside from all that, it's like second to last day, they had us do these uh what they call back tests. Like if you invested this much, you would have X amount today. And did the math, put it, you know, typed in everything, and I, had I gotten Apple in 2010, I would have had like eight hundred ten thousand dollars, eight hundred some thousand, right? I'm just like, this is this is what y'all been doing this this whole ten weeks. This is this. Why did why didn't you tell me? How could I have done this? And like, how different would my life have been if my parents had the access and the ability to have done that, or at least been aware of it at that point in time? So I don't blame my parents because there, there wasn't like any apps back then, right? right so it's like. Right. Yeah, you know, but, but the thing was like, what can I do now? So clearly I didn't have kids at that point, but I wanted to make sure that my kids never have to worry like, what if dad invested in Nike? What if he invested in, in this or an index fund or whatever? You gonna have the answer, yeah. right? It's gonna, it's gonna be six figures a mo. That's what right. the answer gonna be, right? Um, but it's also so much easier to build wealth when you start extremely early yes. that he can easily be a millionaire by 30 or 40. Yeah. Whereas like, I'm like halfway there, you yeah. know, by the time I get yeah. to that point. But yeah. the coolest thing for me and my daughter, who's, who's 10 months, so 
about a year, once she hits like 18 months, a year and a half, she'll probably have exactly what he has. But they have more money now than I had in high school. And I had a, I had a job, yeah. you know, I had, yeah. I had hella jobs, yeah. right? <laughs> so t- for them to already be like past where I was 18, it's just like, you're gonna have so many more options than I have. You know, one of the ways that I tend to oversimplify is I think everything has to go into these orderly steps mm-hmm. where it's like, first I have to do this, and then when that is done to complete perfection, then I can move on to this. And when that is done, then I'll do this, this, and this. And I don't build in any sort of buffer for life <laughs> or just, you know, willpower running out or extra money. Like, it's just very, like, it's a perfectionist thing mm-hmm. where I just have to go step by step. Do you see that a lot? I see it a lot, and it's costly. It is. It's, it's such an expensive it, yeah, trait. There, there's a for for example, because I didn't invest in 1989, it cost me 800 thousand dollars. Right. So right. It's expensive, and yeah. it's gonna take me a long time to catch up to where I could have been. And I think, it, maybe more so in finance, but also in life, like we have to, we sit back and think like you have to be perfect, and that these things need to be checked off in this order for me to go like do these other things. So. Yeah. Is real estate important? Yes. Is paying off your debt important? Yes. But you don't have to get the house and then pay off all the debt and then start investing. investing yeah. It's going to take you so long to do that. Like yeah. We have to realize that you can walk and chew gum. You can save and pay debt and invest. It may not be as much as you want to, and that's fine. It's going to add up at the end of the day. Um, I see clients and students all the time like, yeah, I took your course last year. I just finally started. I'm like... <laughs> I'm glad you started, you made my day, I'm glad you did that. But you just wasted six months of compounded interest that you're not gonna get again. And that's when I told people in 2020, the market fell, I was like, you cannot go back like you can with student loan debt, where it's pause and you can like catch up on payments or have a portion forgiven. I can never go back and say, let me go back in March and put in $10,000. Or to buy that share at yeah, that price. Exactly. I mean, you might get lucky, you know what I mean? Maybe, but right. some catastrophic gonna happen for that. Yeah. Right. Like, I, yeah. I, I, I cannot go back to 2009 or 2010 and get Bitcoin when I first heard about it. Right. Bruh. But you wish you did. Oh, yeah. I and I wanted did. to talk about that. I remember too. exactly where I was when I heard about Bitcoin. Because I feel like you were in the same boat. And I feel like most people who were taught, let's say, in traditional rules of personal finance would have looked at Bitcoin a couple of years ago and said, yeah, nah, too many questions. Yeah. There are way more questions than answers. There, aren't, there isn't enough solid evidence. And let's just be honest, like the whole Satoshi story thing was like off-putting. It was like, I'm not investing. That's l- the literal definition of sketchy, yeah. right? So no, I'm not falling into that. But now, years later, it's pretty undeniable that a lot of, dare I say, value, a lot of money has been generated. I don't, you know, I don't even know that I can consider it value, but the currency itself is becoming, or just crypto, is becoming more and more valuable, not just because of the increase in its cost or price, but because more and more people are finding use for it. You know what I mean? Can you talk a little bit about your sort of understanding of, of crypto and because I feel like you, you're far more open to it now than you were, let's say, five years oh, ago. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Way more yeah. open to it now, but, but still cautious, though. Like, yeah, yeah. So for me, just for, for transparency, like I've been out and said this, like I'm trying to work up to get like three to five percent of my net worth in crypto. And that's it. I ain't doing no more. Um, but that is the exact same consistent rule with any individual stock for me, too. Yeah. So whether it's Apple, I'm only trying to get up to five and that's it. Yeah. Because I, I don't want to take on more risk, especially with something like crypto that can be incredibly volatile. Yes. Um, I think the good thing about it is it's become more validated, is what I like to say, is because in 2017, when it initially like really took off, when it became like a household name, yeah. Goldman Sachs, Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, all of them Yo, stayed out. Wrote it off. We were like, yeah. no, we're not, we're yeah. not touching this yet. Yeah. I ain't putting, I ain't putting the big bucks in it because yeah. I don't know what this is. Now they are, yes. right? So I was like, okay, y'all, y'all got it. And they're adjusting the game to their favor. Exactly. <laughs> well, I have learned more, and that's the thing. I wasn't gonna be into something I ain't learned yet. Yeah. <laughs> so I took the time. <laughs> I sat back, did my research. I learned about it, yeah. and now I'm okay. Like I'm not just gonna jump into it because it's popular. But also during that time, I still had index funds, so it wasn't like I was sitting back doing yeah. absolutely nothing. I think that's also important to note too. 
But with crypto, there's there's opportunity there. We are still learning. This year's already dropped by 50%. Yeah. And that's not uncommon for this type of asset sure class. Isn't. So people nowhere have- Nowhere near the bottom. Right, nowhere near the bottom. <laughs> but I think it's also interesting to note that, to your point, it's dropped almost 50, I haven't been keeping up with it, but 50%, right? Because we've seen that happen so many times, we are now sort of building that into what is normal yes. for this type of asset class. Yeah. If you've looked at that, yes. that's the thing. Because some you people, have yeah, you have to zoom out. Some people have, haven't done that. They saw like a screenshot on Instagram, this dude was up 200%. He didn't tell you he started six, six years ago, right. right? And he just jumped right. into it. Dogecoin is a very good example of that, where it was absolutely a terrible investment, right? And it dropped 90% two years before, People jumped in it anyway, right? You can say the same thing with, with GameStop, with AMC. Yeah. Both those companies, including Hertz, the rental car company, all of them were awful, dropping for years. Yeah. And all of a sudden it became a thing, people jumped into it, and then it fell right after, yeah. right? So yeah. like, you gotta zoom out and say like, do I really know, and am I prepared for that type of risk? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you used to be the financial advisor for very wealthy clients. How do you define rich? How do I define rich? There are a few, few ways. I think outside of just having, having the money to walk away and having the option to walk away. I think that's that's the number one thing. Um, walk away from what? From whatever it is you want to do. Have an option to like, do I got to be at work today? Let me check my balance. Yes or no, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I think the other thing is how long can you decide to walk away too? Cause I might, I might get a month, right? <laughs> but, but rich, rich and wealthy is like, oh, I can step away for three decades. I don't have to turn back. And I think having the choice to do that and whatever that, that time frame may be, it's going to change for different people. I think that's what wealth is. And it's going to look different depending on where you live and what you do and all that type of stuff. Yeah. But I think that's, that's what it is. Having the option to just say, look, I don't have to be here. Yeah. I can be wherever I want to be when I want to be there. Yeah. And I don't have to like, respond to emails or you know per my email whatever like i don't need this because i'm wealthy and yeah, that's power yeah exactly that is that is the ultimate power to, to travel whenever you want to travel to be wherever you want to be and to get there in whatever style you want to get there